Section 14 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. In behalf of Archias the Poet by Cicero. Footnote. Delivered in Rome in 61 B.C. Translated by Charles Duke Yonge. Slightly abridged. It is explained in the argument that Archias was a Greek poet, a native of Antioch who came to Rome in the train of Lucullus when Cicero was a child. Cicero had been for some time a pupil of his and had retained a great regard for him. A man of the name of Gracchus now prosecuted him as a false pretender to the rights of a Roman citizen, according to the provisions of the Lex Papiria, and Cicero defended him. The greatest part of this oration is occupied not in legal arguments, but in a panegyric on Archias, who is believed to have died soon afterwards. It was nearly forty years previous that he had first come to Rome. In footnote. 61 B.C. If there be any natural ability in me, O judges, and I know how slight that is, or if I have any practice as a speaker, and in that line I do not deny that I have some experience, or if I have any method in my oratory, drawn from my study of the liberal sciences, and from that careful training to which I admit that at no part of my life have I ever been disinclined, certainly, of all of those qualities, this Olus Licinius is entitled to be among the first to claim the benefit from me as his peculiar right. For as far as ever my mind can look back upon the space of time that is past, and recall the memory of its earliest youth, tracing my life from that starting point, I see that Archias was the principal cause of my undertaking, and the principal means of my mastering those studies. And if this voice of mine formed by his encouragement and his precepts has at time been the instrument of safety to others, undoubtedly we ought, as far as lies in our power, to help and save the very man from whom we have received that gift, which has enabled us to bring help to many, and salvation to some. And lest any one should, perchance, marvel at this being said by me, as the chief of his ability consists in something else, and not in this system and practice of eloquence, he must be told that even we ourselves have never been wholly devoted to this study. In truth, all the arts which concern the civilizing and humanizing of men have some link which binds them together, and are, as it were, connected by some relationship to one another, and that it may not appear marvelous to any one of you that I, in a formal proceeding like this, and in a regular court of justice, when an action is being tried before a praetor of the Roman people, a most eminent man, and before most impartial judges, before such an assembly and multitude of people as I see around me, employ this style of speaking, which is at variance, not only with the ordinary usages of courts of justice, but with the general style of forensic pleading, I entreat you in this cause to grant me this indulgence suitable to this defendant, and, as I trust, not disagreeable to you, the indulgence, namely, of allowing me, when speaking in defense of a most sublime poet and most learned man, before this concourse of highly educated citizens, before this most polite and accomplished assembly, and before such a praetor as he who is presiding at this trial, to enlarge with a little more freedom than usual on the study of polite literature and refined arts, and, speaking in the character of such a man as that, who, owing to the tranquillity of his life and the studies to which he has devoted himself, has but little experience of the dangers of a court of justice, to employ a new and unusual style of oratory. And if I feel that that indulgence is given and allowed me by you, I will soon cause you to think that this Olus Licinius is a man who, not only, now that he is a citizen, does not deserve to be expunged from the list of citizens, but that he is worthy, even if he were not one, of being now made a citizen. For when first Archias grew out of childhood and out of the studies of those arts by which young boys are gradually trained and refined, he devoted himself to the study of writing, first of all at Antioch, for he was born there and was of high rank there, formerly an illustrious and wealthy city, and the seat of learned men and of liberal sciences, and there it was his lot speedily to show himself superior to all in ability and credit. 
afterward in the other parts of asia and over all greece his arrival was so talked of wherever he came that the anxiety with which he was expected was even greater than the fame of his genius but the admiration which he excited when he had arrived exceeded even the anxiety with which he was expected italy was at that time full of greek science and of greek systems and these studies were at that time cultivated in Latium with greater zeal than they are now in the same towns, and here too at Rome, on account of the tranquil state of the Republic at that time, they were far from neglected. Therefore the people of Tarentum, and Regium, and Neapolis presented him with the freedom of the city and with other gifts, and all men who were capable of judging of genius thought him deserving of their acquaintance and hospitality when from this great celebrity of his he had become known to us though absent he came to rome in the consulship of marius and catullus it was his lot to have those men as his first consuls the one of whom could supply him with the most illustrious achievements to write about the other could give him not only exploits to celebrate but his ears and judicious attention immediately the luculli though archias was as yet but a youth received him in their house but it was not only to his genius and his learning, but also to his natural disposition and virtue that it must be attributed that the house which was the first to be opened to him in his youth is also the one in which he lives most familiarly in his old age. He at that time gained the affection of Quintus Metellus, that great man who was the conqueror of Numidia, and his son Pius. He was eagerly listened to by Marcus Aemilius. He associated with Quintus Catullus, both with the father and the sons. He was highly respected by Lucius Crassus, and as for the Luculli and Drusus, and the Octavi and Cato, and the whole family of the Hortensi, he was on terms of the greatest possible intimacy with all of them, and was held by them in the greatest honor. For not only did every one cultivate his acquaintance who wished to learn or to hear anything, but even every one pretended to have such a desire. In the meantime, after a sufficiently long interval, having gone with Lucius Lucullus into Sicily, and having afterward departed from that province in the company of the same Lucullus, he came to Heraclea. And as that city was one which enjoyed all the rights of a confederate city to their full extent, he became desirous of being enrolled as a citizen of it, and being thought deserving of such a favor for his own sake, when aided by the influence and authority of Lucullus, he easily obtained it from the Heracleans. The freedom of the city was given him in accordance with the provisions of the law of Silvanus and Carbo. If any men had been enrolled as citizens of the confederate cities, and if at the time that the law was passed they had a residence in Italy, and if within sixty days they had made a return of themselves to the praetor, as he had now had a residence at Rome for many years, he returned himself as a citizen to the praetor, Quintus Metellus, his most intimate friend. If we have nothing else to speak about except the rights of citizenship and the law, I need say no more. The cause is over. For which of all these statements, Horatius, can be invalidated? Will you deny that he was enrolled at the time I speak of as a citizen of Heraclete? There is a man present of the very highest authority, a most scrupulous and truthful man, Lucius Lucellus, who will tell you not that he thinks it, but that he knows it, not that he has heard of it, but that he saw it, not even that he was present when it was done, but that he actually did it himself. Deputies from Heraclea are present, men of the highest rank. They have come expressly on account of this trial with a commission from their city, and to give evidence on the part of their city, and they say he was enrolled as a Heraclean. On this you ask for the public registers of the Heracleans, which we all know were destroyed in the Italian war when the register office was burnt. It is ridiculous to say nothing to the proofs which we have, but to ask for proofs which it is impossible for us to have. To disregard the recollection of men and to appeal to the memory of documents. And when you have the conscientious evidence of a most honorable man, the oath and good faith of a most respectable municipality, to reject those things which cannot by any possibility be tampered with, and to demand documentary evidence, though you say at the same moment that that is constantly played tricks with, but he had no residence at Rome, 
what not he who for so many years before the freedom of the city was given to him had established the abode of all his property and fortunes at rome but he did not return himself indeed he did and in that return which alone obtains with the college of praetors the authority of a public document you ask us o gracious why we are so exceedingly attached to this man because he supplies us with food whereby our mind is refreshed after this noise in the forum and with rest for our ears after they have been wearied with bad language do you think it possible that we could find a supply for our daily speeches when discussing such a variety of matters unless we were to cultivate our minds by the study of literature or that our minds could bear being kept so constantly on the stretch if we did not relax them by that same study but i confess that i am devoted to those studies let others be ashamed of them if they have buried themselves in books devoted to those studies let others be ashamed of them for the common advantage or anything which may bear the eyes of men in the light but why need i be ashamed who for many years have lived in such a manner as never to allow my own love of tranquillity to deny me to the necessity or advantage of another or my fondness for pleasure to distract or even sleep to delay my attention to such claims who then can reproach me or who has any right to be angry with me if i allow myself as much time for the cultivation of these studies as some take for the performance of their own business or for celebrating days of festival and games or for other pleasures or even for the rest and refreshment of mind and body or as others devote to early banquets to playing at dice or at ball and this ought to be permitted to me because by these studies my power of speaking and those faculties are improved which as far as they do exist in me have never been denied to my friends when they have been in peril and if that ability appears to any one to be but moderate at all events i know whence i derive those principles which are of the greatest value for if i had not persuaded myself from my youth upward both by the precepts of many masters and by much reading that there is nothing in life greatly to be desired except praise and honor and that while pursuing those things all tortures of the body all dangers of death and banishment are to be considered but of small importance i should never have exposed myself in defence of your safety to such numerous and arduous contests and to these daily attacks of profligate men but all books are full of such precepts and all the sayings of philosophers in all antiquity is full of precedents teaching the same lesson but all these things would lie buried in darkness if the light of literature and learning were not applied to them how many images of the bravest men carefully elaborated have both the greek and latin writers bequeathed to us not merely for us to look at and gaze upon but also for our imitation and i always keeping them before my eyes as examples for my own public conduct have endeavoured to model my mind and views by continually thinking of those excellent men some one will ask what were those identical great men whose virtues have been recorded in books accomplished in all that learning which you are extolling so highly it is difficult to assert this of all of them but still i know what answer i can make to that question i admit that many men have existed of admirable disposition and virtue who without learning by the almost divine instinct of their own mere nature have been of their own accord as it were moderate and wise men i even add this that very often nature without learning has had more to do with leading men to credit into virtue than learning when not assisted by a good natural disposition and i also contend that when to an excellent and admirable natural disposition there is added a certain system and training of education then from that combination arises an extraordinary perfection of character such as is seen in that godlike man whom our father saw in their time africanus and in gaius laelius and lucius purius most virtuous and moderate men and in that most excellent man the most learned man of his time marcus cato the elder and all these men if they have been to derive no assistance from literature in the cultivation and practice of virtue would never have applied themselves to the study of it though even if there were no such great advantage to be reached from it and if it were only pleasure that is sought from these studies still i imagine you would consider it a most reasonable and liberal employment of the mind for other occupations are not suited to every time nor to every age or place but these studies are the food of youth the delight of old age 
the ornament of prosperity, the refuge and comfort of adversity, a delight at home and no hindrance abroad. They are companions by night and in travel, and in the country. And if we ourselves were not able to arrive at these advantages, nor even taste them with our senses, still we ought to admire them, even when we saw them in others. Who of us was not of so ignorant and brutal a disposition as not lately to be grieved at the death of Roseus? Who, though he was an old man when he died, yet on account of the excellence and beauty of his art appeared to be one who on every account ought not to have died? Therefore, had he by the gestures of his body gained so much of our affections, and shall we disregard the incredible movements of the mind and the rapid operations of genius? How often have I seen this man Archias, O judges, for I will take advantage of your kindness, since you listen to me so attentively while speaking in this unusual manner, how often have I seen him, when he had not written a single word, repeat extempore a great number of admirable verses on the very events which were passing at the moment? How often have I seen him go back, and describe the same thing over again with an entire change of language and ideas? and what he wrote with care and with much thought that I have seen admired to such a degree, as to equal the credit of even the writings of the ancients. Should not I then love this man? Should not I admire him? Should not I think it my duty to defend him in any possible way? And indeed we have constantly heard from men of the greatest eminence and learning, that the study of other sciences was made up of learning, and rules, and regular method, but that a poet was such by the unassisted work of nature, and was moved by the vigor of his own mind, and was inspired, as it were, by some divine wrath. Wherefore rightly does our own great Aeneas call poets holy? Because they seem to be recommended to us by some especial gift, as it were, and liberality of the gods. Let then judges this name of poet, this name which no barbarians even have ever disregarded, be holy in your eyes men of cultivated minds as you all are. Rocks and deserts reply to the poet's voice. Savage beasts are often moved and arrested by song. And shall we, who have been trained in the pursuit of the most virtuous acts, refuse to be swayed by the voice of poets? The Colophonians say that Homer was their citizen. The Chians claim him as theirs. The Salaminians assert their right to him. But the men of Smyrna loudly assert him to be a citizen of Smyrna and they have even raised a temple to him in their city. Many other places also fight with one another for the honor of being his birthplace. They then claim a stranger, even after his death, because he was a poet. Shall we reject this man while he is alive? A man who by his own inclination and by our laws does actually belong to us, especially when Archias has employed all his genius with the utmost zeal in celebrating the glory and renown of the Roman people. For when a young man he touched on our wars against the Cimbri, and gained the favor even of Gaius Marius himself, a man who was tolerably proof against this sort of study. For there was no one so disinclined to the muses as not willingly to endure that the praise of his labor should be made immortal by means of verse. They say that the great Themistocles, the greatest man that Athens produced, said when someone asked him what sound or whose voice he took the greatest delight in hearing, the voice of that by whom his own exploits were best celebrated. Therefore the great Marius was also exceedingly attached to Lucius Plotius, because he thought that the achievement which he had performed could be celebrated by his genius. And the whole Mithridatic war, great and difficult as it was, and carried on with so much diversity of fortune by land and sea, has been related at length by him, and the books in which that is sung of, not only make the illustrious Lucius Lucullus, that most gallant and celebrated man, but they do honor also to the Roman people. For while Lucullus was general, the Roman people opened Pontus, though it was defended both by the resources of the king and by the character of the country itself. Under the same general, the army of the Roman people, with no very great numbers, routed the countless hosts of the Armenians. It is the glory of the Roman people that by the wisdom of that same general, the city of the Kaisakines, most friendly to us, was delivered and preserved from all the attacks of the kind, and from the very jaws, as it were, of the whole war. Ours is the glory which will be forever celebrated, which is derived from the fleet of the enemy which was sunk after its admirals had been slain, and from the marvellous naval battle off Tenedos. Those trophies belong to us, 
those monuments are ours those triumphs are ours therefore i say that the men by whose genius these exploits are celebrated make illustrious at the same time the glory of the roman people our countryman Aeneas was dear to the elder Africanus, and even on the tomb of the Scipios his effigy is believed to be visible carved in the marble. But undoubtedly it is not only the men who are themselves praised who are done honor to by these praises, but the name of the Roman people also is adorned by them. Cato, the ancestor of this Cato, is extolled to the skies. Great honor is paid to the exploits of the Roman people, Lastly, all those great men, the Maximi, the Marcoli, and the Pulvi, are done honor to, not without all of us having a share in the panegyric. Therefore our ancestors received the man who was the cause of all this, a man of Rudis, into their city as a citizen. And shall we reject from our city a man of Heraclea, a man sought by many cities and made a citizen of ours by these very laws? For if any one thinks that there is a smaller gain of glory derived from Greek verses than from Latin ones, he is greatly mistaken, because Greek poetry is read among all nations. Latin is confined to its own natural limits which are narrow enough. Wherefore, if those achievements which we have performed are limited only by the bounds of the whole world, we ought to desire that wherever our vigor and our arms have penetrated, our glory and our fame should likewise extend because as this is always an ample reward for those people whose achievements are the subject of writings so especially is it the greatest inducement to encounter labors and dangers to all men who fight for themselves for the sake of glory how many historians of his exploits is alexander the great said to have had with him and he when standing on cape segeum at the grave of achilles said o happy youth to find homer is the panegyrist of your glory and he said the truth for if the Iliad had not existed, the same tomb which covered his body would also have buried his renown. For this should not be concealed, which cannot possibly be kept in the dark, but it might be avowed openly. We are all influenced by a desire of praise, and the best men are the most especially attracted by glory. Those very philosophers, even in the books which they write about despising glory, put their own names on the title page. In the very act of recording their contempt for renown and notoriety, they desire to have their own names known and talked of. Decimus Brutus, that most excellent citizen and consummate general, adorned the approaches to his temples and monuments with the verses of Adius. And lately that great man Fulvius, who fought with the Aetolians, having Aeneas for his companion, did not hesitate to devote the spoils of Mars to the Muses. Wherefore, in a city in which generals, almost in arms, have paid respect to the name of poets and to the temples of the muses, these judges in the garb of peace ought not to act in a manner inconsistent with the honor of the muses and the safety of poets. And that you may do that the more willingly, I will now reveal my own feelings to you, O judges, and I will make a confession to you of my own love of glory. Too eager, perhaps, but still honorable. For this man has in his verses touched upon and begun the celebration of the deeds which we in our consulship did in union with you, for the safety of this city and empire, and in defense of the life of the citizens and of the whole republic. And when I had heard his commencement, because it appeared to me to be a great subject and at the same time an agreeable one, I encouraged him to complete his work, for virtue seeks no other reward for its labors and its dangers beyond that of praise and renown. And if that be denied to it, what reason is there, O judges, why in so small and brief a course of life as is allotted to us, we should impose such labors on ourselves? Certainly if the mind had no anticipations of posterity, and if it were to confine all its thoughts within the same limits as those by which the space of our lives is bounded, it would neither break itself with such severe labors, nor would it be tormented with such cares and sleepless anxiety nor would it so often have to fight for its very life. At present there is a certain virtue in every good man which night and day stirs up the mind with the stimulus of glory, and reminds it that all mention of our name will not cease at the same time with our lives, but that our fame will endure to all posterity. Do we all who are occupied in the affairs of state and who are surrounded by such perils and dangers in life appear to be so narrow-minded as though to the last moment of our lives we have never passed one tranquil or easy moment to think that everything will perish at the same time as ourselves? 
ought we not when many illustrious men have with great care collected and left behind them statues and images representations not of their minds but of their bodies much more to desire to leave behind us a copy of our counsels and of our virtues wrought and elaborated by the greatest genius i thought at the very moment of performing them that i was scattering and disseminating all the deeds which i was performing all over the world for the eternal recollection of nations and whether that delight is to be denied to my soul after death or whether as the wisest men have thought it will affect some portion of my spirit at all events i am at present delighted with some such idea and hope preserve then o judges a man of such virtue as that of archias which you see testified to you not only by the worth of his friends but by the length of time during which they have been such to him and of such genius as you ought to think as his when you see that it has been sought by most illustrious men and his cause is one which is approved of by the benevolence of the law by the authority of his municipality by the testimony of lucullus and by the documentary evidence of metellus and as this is the case we do entreat you judges if there may be any weight attached i will not say to human but even to divine recommendation in such important matters to receive under your protection that man who has at all times done honour to your generals and to the exploits of the roman people who even in these recent perils of our own and in your domestic dangers promises to give an eternal testimony of praise in our favour and who forms one of that band of poets who have at all times and in all nations been considered and called holy so that he may seem relieved by your humanity rather than overwhelmed by your severity the things which according to my custom i have said briefly and simply o judges i trust have been approved by all of you those things which i have spoken without regarding the habits of the forum or judicial usage both concerning the genius of the man and my own zeal in his behalf i trust have been received by you in good part that they have been so by him who presides at this trial i am quite certain End of section 14. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 15 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. The First Oration Against Mark Antony by Cicero Footnote Delivered before the Roman Senate in 44 B.C. Translated by Charles Duke Young Abridged End of footnote Before, O conscript fathers, I say those things concerning the Republic, which I think myself bound to say at the present time, I will explain to you briefly the cause of my departure from and of my return to the city. When I hoped that the Republic was at last recalled to a proper respect for your wisdom and for your authority, I thought that it became me to remain in a sort of sentinelship, which was imposed upon me by my position as a senator and a man of consular rank nor did i depart anywhere nor did i ever take my eyes off from the republic from the day on which we were summoned to meet in the temple of tellus in which temple i as far as was in my power laid the foundations of peace and renewed the ancient precedent set by the athenians i even used the greek word which that city employed in those times in allaying discords and gave my vote that all recollection of the existing dissensions ought to be effaced by everlasting oblivion. Footnote. This meeting took place on the third day after Caesar's death. End of footnote. The oration then made by Marcus Antonius was an admirable one. His disposition, too, appeared excellent. And lastly, by his means and by his sons, peace was ratified with the most illustrious of the citizens, and everything else was consistent with this beginning. He invited the chief men of the state to those deliberations which he held at his own house concerning the state of the republic. He referred all the most important matters to this order. 
nothing was at the time found among the papers of caius caesar except what was already well known to everybody and he gave answers to every question that was asked of him with the greatest consistency were any exiles restored he said that one was and only one were any immunities granted he answered none he wished us even to adopt the proposition of servius sulpicius that most illustrious man footnote a close friend of cicero who was consul in fifty one b c end of footnote that no tablet purporting to contain any decree or grant of caesar's should be published after the ides of march were expired i pass over many other things all excellent for i am hastening to come to a very extraordinary act of virtue of marcus antonius he utterly abolished from the constitution of the republic the dictatorship which had by this time attained to the authority of regal power and that measure was not even offered to us for discussion he brought with him a decree of the senate ready drawn up ordering what he chose to have done and when it had been read we all submitted to his authority in the matter with the greatest eagerness and by another resolution of the senate we returned him thanks in the most honorable and complimentary language a new light as it were seemed to be brought over us now that not only the kingly power which we had endured but all fear of such power for the future was taken away from us and a great pledge appeared to have been given by him to the republic that he did wish the city to be free when he utterly abolished out of the republic the name of dictator which had often been a legitimate title on account of our late recollection of a perpetual dictatorship a few days afterward the senate was delivered from the danger of bloodshed and a hook was fixed into that runaway slave who had usurped the name of caius marius and all these things he did in concert with his colleague some other things that were done were the acts of dolabella alone but if his colleague had not been absent would i believe have been done by both of them in concert footnote cicero's son-in-law who had joined caesar in the civil war and after caesar's death became consul acting with mark antony End footnote. i have now explained to you o conscript fathers my design in leaving the city now i will set before you also my intention in returning which may perhaps appear more unaccountable as i had avoided brundusium and the ordinary route into greece not without good reason on the first of august i arrived at syracuse because the passage from that city into greece was said to be a good one and that city with which i had so intimate a connection could not though it was very eager to do so detain me more than one night i was afraid that my sudden arrival among my friends might cause some suspicion if i had remained there at all but after the winds had driven me on my departure from sicily to lucopetra which is a promontory of the rhegian district i went up the gulf from that point with the view of crossing over and i had not advanced far before i was driven back by a foul wind to the very place which i had just quitted and as the night was stormy and as i had lodged that night in the villa of publius valerius my companion and intimate friend and as i remained all the next day at his house waiting for a fair wind many of the citizens of the municipality of regium came to me and of them there were some who had lately arrived from rome from them i first heard of the harangue of marcus antonius with which i was so much pleased that after i had read it i began for the first time to think of returning and not long afterward the edict of brutus and cassius is brought to me 
which perhaps because i love those men even more for the sake of the republic than of my own friendship for them appeared to me indeed to be full of equity they added besides for it is a very common thing for those who are desirous of bringing good news to invent something to make the news which they bring seem more joyful that parties were coming to an agreement that the senate was to meet on the first of august that antonius having discarded all evil counsellors and having given up the provinces of gaul was about to return to submission to the authority of the senate but on this i was inflamed with such eagerness to return that no oars or winds could be fast enough for me not that i thought that i should not arrive in time but lest i should be later than i wished in congratulating the republic and i quickly arrived at velia where i saw brutus how grieved i was i cannot express for it seemed to be a discreditable thing for me myself that i should venture to return into that city from which brutus was departing and that i should be willing to live safely in a place where he could not but he himself was not agitated in the same manner that i was for being elevated with the consciousness of his great and glorious exploit he had no complaints to make of what had befallen him though he lamented your fate exceedingly and it was from him that i first heard what had been the language of lucius piso in the senate of august who although he was but little assisted for that i heard from brutus himself by those who ought to have seconded him still according to the testimony of brutus and what evidence can be more trustworthy and to the avowal of every one whom i saw afterward appeared to me to have gained great credit i hastened hither therefore in order that as those who were present had not seconded him i might do so not with the hope of doing any good for i neither hoped for that nor did i well see how it was possible but in order that if anything happened to me and many things appeared to be threatening me out of the regular course of nature and even of destiny i might still leave my speech on this day as a witness to the republic of my everlasting attachment to its interests what reason had marcus antonius for endeavouring with such bitter hostility to force me into the senate yesterday was i the only person who was absent have you not repeatedly had thinner houses than yesterday or was a matter of such importance under discussion that it was desirable for even sick men to be brought down hannibal i suppose was at the gates or there was to be a debate about peace with pyrrhus on which occasion it is related that even the great appius old and blind as he was was brought down to the senate house there was a motion being made about some supplications a kind of measure when senators are not usually wanting for they are under the compulsion not of pledges but of the influence of those men whose honour is being complimented and the case is the same when the motion has reference to a triumph the consuls are so free from anxiety at these times that it is almost entirely free for a senator to absent himself if he pleases and as the general custom of our body was well known to me and as i was hardly recovered from the fatigue of my journey i was vexed with myself i sent a man to him out of regard for my friendship with him to tell him that i should not be there but he in the hearing of you all declared that he would come with masons to my house this was said with too much passion and very intemperately for what known crime is there such a heavy punishment appointed as that that any one should venture to say in this assembly that he with the assistance of a lot of common operatives would pull down a house which had been built at the public expense in accordance with a vote of the senate and whoever employed such compulsion as the threat of such an injury as that to a senator or what severer punishment has ever been imposed for absence than the forfeiture of a pledge or a fine 
but if he had known what opinion I should have delivered on the subject, he would have remitted somewhat of the rigor of his compulsion. Do you think, O oh conscript fathers, that I would have voted for the resolution which you adopted against your own wills, of mingling funeral obsequies with supplications, of introducing inexplicable impiety into the republic, of decreeing supplications in honor of a dead man? I say nothing about who the man was. Even had he been the great Lucius Brutus, who himself also delivered the republic from kingly power, and who has produced posterity nearly five hundred years after himself of similar virtue and equal to similar achievements, even then I could not have been induced to join any dead man in a religious observance paid to the immortal gods so that a supplication should be addressed by public authority to a man who has nowhere a sepulchre at which funeral obsequies may be celebrated. I, conscript fathers, should have delivered my opinion which I could easily have defended against the Roman people if any heavy misfortune had happened to the Republic, such as war or pestilence or famine, some of which indeed do exist already, and I have my fears lest others are impending. But I pray that the immortal gods may pardon this act, both to the Roman people, which does not approve of it, and to this order, which voted it with great unwillingness. What, may I not speak of the other misfortunes of the Republic? At all events, it is in my power, and it always will be in my power, to uphold my dignity and to despise death. Let me have only the power to come into this house, and I will never shrink from the danger of declaring my opinion. In the first place, then, I declare my opinion that the acts of Caesar ought to be maintained. Not that I approve of them, for who indeed can do that, but because I think that we ought, above all things, to have regard to peace and tranquillity. I wish that Antonius himself were present, provided he had no advocates with him. But I suppose he may be allowed to feel unwell a privilege which he refused to allow me yesterday he would then explain to me or rather to you conscript fathers to what extent he himself defended the acts of caesar are all the acts of caesar which may exist in the bits of notebooks and memoranda and loose papers produced on his single authority and indeed not even produced but only recited to be ratified and shall the acts which he caused to be engraved on brass in which he declared that the edicts and laws passed by the people were valid for ever be considered as of no power i think indeed that there is nothing so well entitled to be called the acts of caesar as caesar's laws suppose he gave any one a promise is that to be ratified even if it were a promise that he himself was unable to perform? As, in fact, he has failed to perform many promises made to many people, and a great many more of those promises have been found since his death than the number of all the services which he conferred on and did to people during all the years that he was alive would amount to. What law was ever better more advantageous, more frequently demanded in the best ages of the Republic than the one which forbade the Praetorian provinces to be retained more than a year, and the consular provinces more than two. If this law be abrogated, do you think that the acts of Caesar are maintained? What, are not all the laws of Caesar respecting judicial proceedings abrogated by the law which has been proposed concerning the third decury? And are you the defenders of the acts of Caesar who overturn his laws? Unless, indeed, anything which, for the purpose of recollecting it, he entered in a notebook, is to be counted among his acts and defended, however unjust or useless it may be, 
and that which he proposed to the people in the Comitia Centuriata and carried is not to be accounted one of the acts of Caesar. But what is the third decury? The decury of centurions, says he. What was not the judicature open to that order by the Julian law, and even before that by the Pompeian and Aurelian laws? The income of the men, says he, was exactly defined. Certainly not only in the case of a centurion, but in the case, too, of a Roman knight. Therefore, men of the highest honor and of the greatest bravery, who have acted as centurions, are and have been judges. I am not asking about those men, says he. Whoever has acted as centurion, let him be a judge. But if you were to propose a law that whoever had served in the cavalry, which is a higher post, should be a judge, you would not be able to induce any one to approve of that. For a man's fortune and worth ought to be regarded in a judge. I am not asking about those points, says he. I am going to add as judges common soldiers of the legion of Eludiae. For our friends say that this is the only measure by which they can be saved. Oh, what an insulting compliment it is to those men whom you summon to act as judges, though they never expected it. For the effect of the law is to make those men judges in the third decury who do not dare to judge with freedom. And in that, how great, ye immortal gods, is the error of those men who have desired that law. For the meaner the condition of each judge is, the greater will be the severity of judgment with which he will seek to efface the idea of his meanness, and he will strive rather to appear worthy of being classed in the honorable decuries than to have deservedly ranked in a disreputable one. Men have been recalled from banishment by a dead man. The freedom of the city has been conferred not only on individuals but on entire nations and provinces by a dead man. Our revenues have been diminished by the granting of countless exemptions by a dead man. Therefore, do we defend these measures which have been brought from his house on the authority of a single, but, I admit, a very excellent individual? And as for the laws, which he in your presence read and declared and passed, in the passing of which he gloried, and on which he believed that the safety of the Republic depended, especially those concerning provinces and concerning judicial proceedings, can we, I say, we who defend the acts of Caesar, think that those laws deserve to be upset? And yet concerning those laws which were proposed we have at all events the power of complaining but concerning those which are actually passed we have not even had that privilege for they without any proposal of them to the people were passed before they were framed men ask what is the reason why i or why any one of you conscript fathers should be afraid of bad laws why we have virtuous tribunes of the people. We have men ready to interpose their veto, ready to defend the republic with the sanctions of religion. We ought to be strangers to fear. What do you mean by interposing the veto, says he? What are all these sanctions of religion which you are talking about? Those, forsooth, on which the safety of the republic depends. We are neglecting those things, and thinking them too old-fashioned and foolish. The forum will be surrounded, every entrance of it will be blocked up, armed men will be placed in garrison, as it were, at many points. What then? Whatever is accomplished by those means will be law. And you will order, I suppose, all those regularly passed decrees to be engraved on brazen tablets. The consuls consulted the people in regular form. Is this the way of consulting the people that we have received from our ancestors, and the people voted it with due regularity? What people? 
that which was excluded from the forum? Under what law did they do so? Under that which has been wholly abrogated by violence and arms? But I am saying all this with reference to the future, because it is the part of a friend to point out evils which may be avoided, and if they never ensue, that will be the best refutation of my speech. I am speaking of laws which have been proposed, concerning which you have still full power to decide either way. I am pointing out the defects. Away with them! I am denouncing violence and arms. Away with them, too. You and your colleague, O Dolabella, ought not indeed to be angry with me for speaking in defense of the Republic. Although I do not think that you yourself will be, I know your willingness to listen to reason. They say that your colleague in this fortune of his, which he himself thinks so good, but which would seem to me more favorable, if not to use any harsh language, he were to imitate the example set him by the consulship of his grandfathers and of his uncle. They say that he has been exceedingly offended. And I see what a formidable thing it is to have the same man angry with me and also armed, especially at a time when men can use their swords with such impunity. But I will propose a condition which I myself think reasonable, and which I do not imagine Marcus Antonius will reject. If I have said anything insulting against his way of life or against his morals, I will not object to his being my bitterest enemy. But if I have maintained the same habits that I have already adopted in the Republic, that is, if I have spoken my opinions concerning the affairs of the Republic with freedom, in the first place, I beg that he will not be angry with me for that. But in the next place, if I cannot obtain my first request, I beg at least that he will show his anger only as he legitimately may show it to a fellow citizen. Let him employ arms if it is necessary, as he says it is, for his own defense. Only let not those arms injure those men who have declared their honest sentiments in the affairs of the Republic. Now what can be more reasonable than this demand? But if, as has been said to me by some of his intimate friends, every speech which is at all contrary to his inclination is violently offensive to him, even if there be no insult in it whatever, then we will bear with the natural disposition of our friend. But those men at the same time say to me, You will not have the same license granted to you who are the adversary of Caesar, as might be claimed by Piso, his father-in-law. And then they warn me of something which I must guard against. And certainly the excuse which sickness supplies me with for not coming to the Senate will not be a more valid one than that which is furnished by death. But in the name of the immortal gods, for while I look upon you, Dolabella, who are most dear to me, it is impossible for me to keep silence respecting the error into which you are both falling, for I believe that you, being both men of high birth, entertaining lofty views, have been eager to acquire, not money, as some too credulous people suspect, a thing which has at all times been scorned by every honorable and illustrious man, nor power, procured by violence and authority, such as never ought to be endured by the Roman people, but the affection of your fellow citizens and glory." But glory is praise for deeds which have been done, and the fame earned by great services to the Republic, which is approved of by the testimony borne in its favor not only by every virtuous man, but also by the multitude. I would tell you, Dolabella, what the fruit of good actions is, if I did not see that you have already learned it by experience beyond all other men. 
what day can you recollect in your whole life as ever having beamed on you with a more joyful light than the one on which having purified the forum having routed the throng of wicked men having inflicted due punishment on the ringleaders in wickedness and having delivered the city from conflagration and from fear of massacre you return to your house what order of society what class of people what rank of nobles even was there who did not then show their zeal in praising and congratulating you even i too because men thought that you had been acting by my advice in those transactions received the thanks and congratulations of good men in your name remember i pray you dolabella the unanimity displayed on that day in the theatre when every one, forgetful of the causes on account of which they had been previously offended with you, showed that in consequence of your recent service they had banished all recollection of their former indignation. Could you, Dolabella, it is with great concern that I speak, could you, I say, forfeit this dignity with equanimity? And you, Marcus Antonius, I address myself to you, though in your absence, do you not prefer that day on which the Senate was assembled in the temple of Tellus to all those months during which some who differ greatly in opinion from me think that you have been happy? What a noble speech was that of yours about unanimity! From what apprehensions were the veterans, and from what anxiety was the whole state relieved by you on that occasion? when having laid aside your enmity against him you on that day first consented that your present colleague should be your colleague forgetting that the auspices had been announced by yourself as augur of the roman people and when your little son was sent by you to the capital to be a hostage for peace on what day was the senate ever more joyful than on that day or when was the roman people more delighted which had never met in greater numbers in any assembly whatever. Then, at last, we did appear to have been really delivered by brave men, because, as they have willed it to be, peace was following liberty. On the next day, on the day after that, on the third day, and on all the following days, you went on without intermission, giving every day, as it were, some fresh present to the Republic, but the greatest of all presents was that when you abolished the name of the dictatorship. This was, in effect, branding the name of the dead Caesar with everlasting ignominy. And it was your doing, yours, I say, for as on account of the wickedness of one Marcus Manlius, by a resolution of the Manlian family, it is unlawful that any patrician should be called Manlius so you on account of the hatred excited by one dictator have utterly abolished the name of dictator when you had done these mighty exploits for the safety of the republic did you repent of your fortune or of the dignity and renown and glory which you had acquired whence then is this sudden change i cannot be induced to suspect that you have been caught by the desire of acquiring money every one may say what he pleases but we are not bound to believe such a thing for i never saw anything sordid or anything mean in you although a man's intimate friends do sometimes corrupt his natural disposition still i know your firmness and i only wish that as you avoid that fault you had been able also to escape all suspicion of it what i am more afraid of is lest being ignorant of the true path to glory you should think it glorious for you to have more power by yourself than all the rest of the people put together and lest you should prefer being feared by your fellow citizens to being loved by them and if you do think so you are ignorant of the road to glory for a citizen to be dear to his fellow citizens to deserve well of the republic, to be praised, to be respected, to be loved, is glorious. But to be feared and to be an object of hatred is odious, detestable, and moreover pregnant with weakness and decay. And we see that, even in the play, the very man who said, 
what care i though all men should hate my name so long as fear accompanies their hate found it that it was a mischievous principle to act upon i wish antonius that you could recollect your grandfather of whom however you have repeatedly heard me speak do you think that he would have been willing to deserve even immortality at the price of being feared in consequence of his licentious use of arms what he considered life what he considered prosperity was the being equal to the rest of the citizens in freedom and chief of them all in worth therefore to say no more of the prosperity of your grandfather i should prefer that most bitter day of his death to the domination of lucius cena by whom he was most barbarously slain but why should i seek to make an impression on you by my speech for if the end of caius caesar cannot influence you to prefer being loved to being feared no speech of any one will do any good or have any influence with you and those who think him happy are themselves miserable no one is happy who lives on such terms that he may be put to death not merely with impunity but even to the great glory of his slayer wherefore change your mind i entreat you and look back upon your ancestors and govern the republic in such a way that your fellow-citizens may rejoice that you were born without which no one can be happy nor illustrious and indeed you have both of you had many judgments delivered respecting you by the roman people by which i am greatly concerned that you are not sufficiently influenced for what was the meaning of the shouts of the innumerable crowd of citizens collected at the gladiatorial games or of the verses made by the people or of the extraordinary applause at the sight of the statue of pompeius and at the sight of the two tribunes of the people who were opposed to you are these things a feeble indication of the incredible unanimity of the entire roman people what more did the applause at the games of apollo or should i rather say testimony and judgment there given by the roman people appear to you of small importance oh happy are those men who though they themselves were unable to be present on account of the violence of arms still were present in spirit and had a place in the breasts and hearts of the roman people unless perhaps you think it was Assius who was applauded on that occasion who had bore off the palm sixty years after his first appearance and not brutus who was absent from the games which he himself was exhibiting while at that most splendid spectacle the roman people showed their zeal in his favour though he was absent and soothed their own regret for their deliverer by uninterrupted applause and clamour i myself indeed am a man who have at all times despised that applause which is bestowed by the vulgar crowd but at the same time when it is bestowed by those of the highest and of the middle and of the lowest rank and in short by all ranks together and when those men who were previously accustomed to aim at nothing but the favour of the people kept aloof i then think that not mere applause but a deliberate verdict if this appears to you unimportant which is in reality most significant do you also despise the fact of which you have had experience namely that the life of aulus hirtius is so dear to the roman people for it was sufficient for him to be esteemed by the roman people as he is to be popular among his friends in which respect he surpasses everybody to be beloved by his own kinsmen who do love him beyond measure but in whose case before do we ever recollect such anxiety and such fear being manifested certainly in no one's footnote hirtius was the close personal and political friend of julius caesar after caesar's death he became consul with panza hirtius opposed mark antony's ambitious schemes and defeated him in battle but was himself killed while leading an assault he is believed to have written the eighth book of the commentaries of the gallic war it has been thought that hirtius had he possessed a loftier ambition or more imperial mind might have prevented the ascendancy of octavius and antony 
End footnote. What then are we to do? In the name of the immortal gods, can you interpret these facts and see what is their purport? What do you think that those men think of your lives, to whom the lives of those men who they hope will consult the welfare of the Republic are so dear? I have reaped, conscript fathers, the reward of my return, since I have said enough to bear testimony of my consistency, whatever event may befall me, and since I have been kindly and attentively listened to by you, and if I have such opportunities frequently without exposing both myself and you to danger, I shall avail myself of them. If not, as far as I can, I shall reserve myself not for myself, but rather for the Republic. I have lived long enough for the course of human life, or for my own glory. If any additional life is granted to me, I shall be bestowed not so much on myself as on you and on the Republic. End of section 15. Section 16 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 2. The Second Oration Against Mark Antony by Cicero. 44 B.C. Footnote. The second oration against Antony, here abridged, was never actually delivered by Cicero, the reason being explained in the argument prefixed to Mr. Young's translation as follows. The Senate met in the Temple of Concord, but Cicero himself was persuaded not to attend by his friends, who were afraid of Antony proceeding to actual violence against him, and indeed he brought a strong guard of armed men with him to the senate he spoke with the greatest fury against cicero charging him with having been the principal author and contriver of caesar's murder hoping by this to inflame the soldiers who he had posted within hearing of this harangue soon after this cicero removed to a villa near naples for greater safety and here he composed this second philippic which he did not publish immediately but contented himself at first with sending a copy to brutus and cassius who were much pleased with it End footnote. to what destiny of mine o conscript fathers shall i say that it is owing that none for the last twenty years has been an enemy to the republic without at the same time declaring war against me nor is there any necessity for naming any particular person you yourselves recollect instances in proof of my statement they have all hitherto suffered severer punishments than i could have wished for them but i marvel that you antonius do not fear the end of those men whose conduct you are imitating and in others i was less surprised at this none of those men of former times was a voluntary enemy to me all of them were attacked by me for the sake of the republic but you who have never been injured by me not even by a word in order to appear more audacious than catiline more frantic than claudius have of your own accord attacked me with abuse and have considered that your alienation from me would be a recommendation of you to impious citizens what am i to think that i have been despised i see nothing either in my life or in my influence in the city or in my exploits or even in the moderate abilities with which i am endowed which antonius can despise did he think that it was easiest to disparage me in the senate a body which has borne its testimony in favor of many most illustrious citizens that they governed the republic well but in favor of me alone of all men that i preserved it or did he wish to contend with me in a rivalry of eloquence 
this indeed is an act of generosity for what could be a more fertile or richer subject for me than to have to speak in defence of myself and against antonius this in fact is the truth he thought it impossible to prove to the satisfaction of those men who resembled himself that he was an enemy to his country if he was not also an enemy to me and before i make him any reply on the other topics of his speech i will say a few words respecting the friendship formerly subsisting between us which he has accused me of violating for that i consider a most serious charge he has complained that i pleaded once against his interest was i not to plead against one with whom i was quite unconnected in behalf of an intimate acquaintance of a dear friend was i not to plead against interest acquired not by hopes of virtue but by the disgrace of youth was i not to plead against an injustice which that man procured to be done by the obsequiousness of a most iniquitous interposer of his veto not by any law regulating the privileges of the praetor but i imagine that this was mentioned by you in order that you might recommend yourself to the citizens if they all recollected that you were the son-in-law of a freedman and that your children were the grandson of quintus fabius a freedman but you had entirely devoted yourself to my principles for this is what you said you had been in the habit of coming to my house in truth if you had done so you would more have consulted your own character and your reputation for chastity but you did not do so nor if you had wished it would caius curio have ever suffered you to do so but i availed myself of your friendly assistance of what assistance although the instance which you cite i have myself at all times openly admitted i preferred confessing that i was under obligations to you to letting myself appear to any foolish person not sufficiently grateful however what was the kindness that you did me not killing me at brindusium would you have then slain the man whom the conqueror himself who conferred on you as he used to boast the chief rank among all his robbers had desired to be safe and had enjoined to go to italy grant that you could have slain him is not this conscript fathers such a kindness as is done by banditti who are contented with being able to boast that they have granted their lives to all those men whose lives they have not taken and if that were really a kindness than those who slew that man by whom they themselves have been saved and whom you yourself are in the habit of styling most illustrious men would never have acquired such immortal glory but what sort of kindness is it to have abstained from committing nefarious wickedness it is a case in which it ought not to appear so delightful to me not to have been killed by you as miserable that it should have been in your power to do such a thing with impunity however grant that it was a kindness since no greater kindness could be received from a robber still at what point can you call me ungrateful ought i not to complain of the ruin of the republic lest i should appear ungrateful toward you but he also read letters which he said that i had sent to him like a man devoid of humanity and ignorant of the common usages of life for whoever who was even but slightly acquainted with the habits of polite men produced in an assembly and openly read letters which had been sent to him by a friend just because some quarrel had arisen between them is not this destroying all companionship in life destroying the means by which absent friends converse together how many jests are frequently put in letters which if they were produced in public would appear stupid how many serious opinions which for all that ought not to be published let this be a proof of your utter ignorance of courtesy 
Now mark also his incredible folly. What have you to oppose to me, you eloquent man, as you seem at least to Mustela Tamesis and to Tiro Numisius? And while these men are standing at this very time in the sight of the Senate with drawn swords, I too will think you an eloquent man if you will show how you would defend them if they were charged with being assassins. However, what answer would you make if I were to deny that I ever sent those letters to you? By what evidence could you convict me? By my handwriting? Of handwriting, indeed, you have a lucrative knowledge. How can you prove it in that manner? For the letters are written by an amanuensis. By this time I envy your teacher, for all that payment which I shall mention presently has taught you to know nothing. Footnote. It has been pointed out that Cicero here means to insinuate that Mark Antony had been forging Caesar's handwriting in signature. End of footnote. You have said that Publius Clodius was slain by my contrivance. What would men have thought if he had been slain at the time when you pursued him in the forum, with a drawn sword, in the sight of all the Roman people? And when you would have settled his business, if he had not thrown himself up the stairs of a bookseller's shop, and shutting them against you, checked your attack by that means? And I confess that at the time I favored you, but even you yourself do not say that I had advised your attempt but as for Milo, it was not possible even for me to favor his action. For he had finished the business before anyone could suspect that he was going to do it. Oh, but I advised it. I suppose Milo was a man of such a disposition that he was not able to do a service to the Republic if he had not someone to advise him to do it. But I rejoiced at it. Well, I suppose I did. Was I to be the only sorrowful person in the city, when everyone else was in such delight? Although that inquiry into the death of Publius Clodius was not instituted with any great wisdom. For what was the reason for having a new law to inquire into the conduct of the man who had slain him, when there was a form of inquiry already established by the laws? However, an inquiry was instituted. And have you now been found, so many years afterward, to say a thing which, at the time that the affair was under discussion, no one ventured to say against me? But as to the assertion that you have dared to make, and that at great length, too, that it was by my means that Pompeius was alienated from his friendship with Caesar, and that on the account it was my fault that the civil war was originated, and that you have not erred so much in the main facts as, and that is of the greatest importance, in the times. When Marcus Bibulus, a most illustrious citizen, was consul, I omitted nothing which I could possibly do or attempt to draw off Pompeius from his union with Caesar, in which, however, Caesar was more fortunate than I for he himself drew off Pompeius from his intimacy with me. But afterward, when Pompeius joined Caesar with all his heart, what could have been my object in attempting to separate them then? It would have been the part of a fool to hope to do so, and of an impudent man to advise it. However, two occasions did arise on which I gave Pompeius advice against Caesar. You are at liberty to find fault with my conduct on those occasions, if you can, one was when I advised him not to continue Caesar's government for five years more, the other when I advised him not to permit him to be considered as a candidate for the consulship when he was absent, and if I had been able to prevail on him in either of those particulars, we should never have fallen into our present miseries. Moreover, I also, when Pompeius had now devoted to the service of Caesar all his own power, and all the power of the Roman people, and had begun, when it was too late, to perceive all those things which I had foreseen long before, 
and when i saw that a nefarious war was about to be waged against our country i never ceased to be the adviser of peace and concord and some arrangement and that language of mine was well known to many people i wish cnaeus pompeius that you had either never joined in a confederacy with gaius caesar or else that you had never broken it off the one conduct would have become your dignity and the other would have been suited to your prudence this marcus antonius was at all times my advice both respecting pompeius and concerning the republic and if it had prevailed the republic would still be standing and you would have perished through your own crimes and indigence and infamy but these are all old stories now this charge however is quite a modern one that caesar was slain by my contrivance i am afraid o oh conscript fathers lest i should appear to you to have brought up a sham accuser against myself which is a most disgraceful thing to do a man not only to distinguish me by the praises which are my due but to load me also with those which do not belong to me for who ever heard my name mentioned as an accomplice in that most glorious action and whose name has been concealed who was in the number of that gallant band concealed do i say whose name was there which was not at once made public i should sooner say that some men had boasted in order to appear to have been concerned in that conspiracy though they had in reality known nothing of it than that any one who had been an accomplice in it could have wished to be concealed moreover how likely is it that among such a number of men some obscure some young men who had not the wit to conceal any one my name could possibly have escaped notice indeed if leaders were wanted for the purpose of delivering the country what need was there of my instigating the bruti one of whom saw every day in his house the image of lucius brutus and the other saw also the image of ahala were these the men to seek counsel from the ancestors of others rather than from their own and out of doors rather than at home what caius cassius a man of that family which could not endure i will not say the domination but even the power of any individual he i suppose was in need of me to instigate him a man who even without the assistance of these other most illustrious men would have accomplished this same deed in cilicia at the mouth of the river sidonus if caesar had brought his ships to the bank of the river which he had intended and not to the opposite one was cnaeus domitius spurred on to seek to recover his dignity not by the death of his father a most illustrious man nor by the death of his uncle nor by the deprivation of his own dignity but by my advice and authority did i persuade caius tribonius a man whom i should not have ventured even to advise on which account the republic owes him even a larger debt of gratitude because he preferred the liberty of the roman people to the friendship of one man and because he preferred overthrowing arbitrary power to sharing it was i the instigator whom lucius tilius kimber followed a man whom i admired for having performed that action rather than ever expected that he would perform it and i admired him on this account that he was unmindful of the personal kindness which he had received but mindful of his country what shall i say of the two servili shall i call them cascus or ahalus and do you think that those men were instigated by my authority rather than by their affection for the republic it would take a long time to go through all the rest it is a glorious thing for the republic that they were so numerous and a most honourable thing also for themselves but recollect i pray you how that clever man convicted me of being an accomplice in the business when caesar was slain says he marcus brutus immediately lifted up on high his bloody dagger and called on cicero by name and congratulated him on liberty being recovered why on me above all men 
because I knew of it beforehand? Consider, rather, whether this was not his reason for calling on me, that when he had performed an action very like those which I myself had done, he called me above all men to witness that he had been an imitator of my exploits. But you, stupidest of all men, do not you perceive that if it is a crime to have wished that Caesar should be slain, which you accuse me of having wished, it is a crime also to have rejoiced at his death? For what is the difference between a man who has advised an action and one who has approved of it? Or what does it signify whether I wished it to be done or rejoice that it has been done? Is there any one then except you yourself and those men who wished him to become a king who was unwilling that that deed should be done or who disapproved of it after it was done? All men, therefore, are guilty as far as this goes. In truth, all good men, as far as it depended on them, bore a part in the slaying of Caesar. Some did not know how to contrive it, some had not courage for it, some had no opportunity. Everyone had the inclination. Shall we then examine your conduct from the time you were a boy? I think so. Let us begin at the beginning. Do you recollect that while you were still clad in the pretexta you became a bankrupt? That was the fault of your father, you will say. I admit that. In truth, such a defense is full of filial affection. But it is peculiarly suited to your own audacity that you sat among the fourteen rows of the knights, though by the Roskian law there was a place appointed for bankrupts even if any one had become such by the fault of fortune and not by his own. You assumed the manly gown, which you soon made a womanly one, at first a public prostitute, with a regular price for your wickedness, and that not a low one. But very soon Curio stepped in, who carried you off from your public trade, and, as if he had bestowed a matron's robe upon you, settled you in a steady and durable wedlock. No boy bought for the gratification of passion was ever so wholly in the power of his master as you were in Curio's. How often has his father turned you out of his house? How often has he placed guards to prevent you from entering, while you, with night for your accomplice, lust for your encourager, and wages for your compeller, were let down through the roof the house could no longer endure your wickedness. Do you not know I am speaking of matters with which I am thoroughly acquainted? Remember that time when Curio, the father, lay weeping in his bed, his son throwing himself at my feet with tears recommended to me you? He entreated me to defend you against his own father, if he demanded six millions of sesterces of you, for that he had been bail for you to that amount and he himself, burning with love, declared positively that because he was unable to bear the misery of being separated from you, he should go into banishment. And at that time, what misery of that most flourishing family did I allay, or rather did I remove? I persuaded the father to pay the son's debts, to release the young man, endowed as he was with great promise of courage and ability by the sacrifice of part of his family estate, and to use his privileges and authority as a father to prohibit him not only from all intimacy with, but from every opportunity of meeting you. When you recollected that all this was done by me, would you have dared to provoke me by abuse? if you had not been trusting to those swords which we behold. But let us say no more of your profligacy and debauchery. There are things which it is not possible for me to mention with honor, but you are all the more free for that, inasmuch as you have not scrupled to be an actor in scenes which a modest enemy cannot bring himself to mention. Mark now, O conscript fathers, the rest of his life, which I will touch upon rapidly, 
for my inclination hastens to arrive at those things which he did in the time of the civil war amid the greatest miseries of the republic and at those things which he does every day and i beg of you though they are far better known to you than they are to me still to listen attentively as you are doing to my relation of them for in such cases as this it is not the mere knowledge of such actions that ought to excite the mind but the recollection of them also and we must at once go into the middle of them lest otherwise we should be too long in the coming to the end he was very intimate with claudius at the time of his tribuneship he who now enumerates the kindness which he did me he was the firebrand to handle all conflagrations and even in his house he attempted something he himself well knows what i allude to from thence he made a journey to alexandria in defiance of the authority of the senate and against the interests of the republic and in spite of religious obstacles but he had gabinius for his leader with whom whatever he did was sure to be right what were the circumstances of his return from thence what sort of return was it he went from egypt to the farthest extremity of gaul before he returned home and what was his home for at that time every man had possession of his own house and you had no house anywhere antonius house do you say what place was there in the whole world where you could set your foot on anything that belonged to you except myanum which you farmed with your partners as if it had been sisypo you came from gaul to stand for the questorship dare to say that you went to your own father before you came to me i had already received caesar's letters begging me to allow myself to accept of your excuses and therefore i did not allow you even to mention thanks after that i was treated with respect by you and you received attentions from me in your canvass for the questorship and it was at that time indeed that you endeavoured to slay publius clodius in the forum with the approbation of the roman people and though you made the attempt of your own accord and not at my instigation still you clearly alleged that you did not think unless you slew him that you could possibly make amends to me for all the injuries which you had done me and this makes me wonder why you should say that milo did that deed at my instigation when i never once exhorted you to do it who of your own accord attempted to do me the same service although if you had persisted in it i should have preferred allowing the action to be set down entirely to your own love of glory rather than to my influence it was you you i say o marcus antonius who gave gaius caesar desirous as he already was to throw everything into confusion the principal pretext for waging war against his country for what other pretense did he allege what cause did he give for his own most frantic resolution and action except that the power of interposition by the veto had been disregarded the privileges of the tribunes taken away and antonius's rights abridged by the senate i say nothing of how false how trivial these pretenses were especially when there could not possibly be any reasonable cause whatever to justify any one in taking up arms against his country but i have nothing to do with caesar you must unquestionably allow that the cause of that ruinous war existed in your person End section sixteen